and ask that first. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, but I, I think it's in Blackboard if you don't have it too. I sent it on an email, but if you don't get the email, it's uh, in Blackboard. Okay. Uh, so, documents and controls over the revenue cycle. The the CPA exam will actually does a lot of focusing on documents, and they, they could be whether they're paper or electronic. So, getting kind of used to those things is a is a good uh, is a good thing. Okay, uh, first one, <clears throat> customer purchase order. Now, customer purchase orders are usually used by businesses. You don't you don't see that with uh, for, for you know you don't walk into Walmart with a purchase order. You just go and buy it. So it, it, this isn't always the case for all companies, but uh, the customer purchase order it usually shows the. Um, Initiated and usually it has a price on it. Let's see. So this comes from outside of the company. This is not um, this is not the, the your client doing it. Someone from outside will do a, a um, customer purchase order again. Not all businesses, but some of them will have, especially if they sell to other businesses, they'll have a purchase order. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, oh, yeah, I see. Cool. Sales order. This is a client I've seen the sales process. So if, it, if it, it, it could come right, right off of the purchase order, that it could mirror the purchase order. Again, if they don't have a purchase order, it would be just be documentation that something was sold. Um, that's what a cash register tape is. It's just documenting, it's just documenting that this is a, a sales order that was completed. All right, uh, credit approval. Here's a question for you. Who do you think should do the credit approval? Let me tell you who it's not done by. Oh well, yeah, it could, be, it could be credit approval. It could be an actual department for credit approval. Uh, it could also be in finance, usually. Um, but. It is not done by the sales department. And it is not done by um, uh, the accounts receivable, the accounting. Those need no notes. So usually there's some kind of finance. If it's a large company, a lot of times they'll have a separate department for it. Uh, pick list. A uh, pick list and packing list. Packing list, you guys all know about. But um, a pick list is, is used for internal, and it'll be completing as much of the sales order as you can. This is where items are actually. Now, uh, as you all well know that sometimes you order something, you order 10 things and they send eight to them out of stock or whatever, um, especially nowadays. Uh, so uh, the M is picked and, and picked for delivery. 
these items will not always match what is on the um, sales order or the uh, purchase order. Occasionally, you'll see someone write um, uh, auditing steps, and it'll say, "Make sure that the um, you know the invoice and the packing list uh, match the uh, the sales order." They they don't always do that, but anything that's on the sales order uh, that can be shipped, you can't overship it. It's called channel stuffing. But anything that's on that list, you can um, it, it is is a valid. Uh, transaction is somebody who asked for it and that it, it was is being shipped to them. You may not have everything to, sh to ship to them, and the and the packing list and the invoice may not match the um, sales order. But uh, but 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 here's the thing: the packing list and the invoice should match each other. So if there's eight items shipped, those eight items should be on the invoice, not ten that was ordered or whatever. Okay, the shipping function. This is key because Shipping function determines what was sold during the uh, during the year. So you'll have a cutoff. And actually, we'll do that hopefully tonight. Um, uh, a cutoff thing for the, the shipping to see what was actually sold during the year. So this is a very important function. Those things that are shipped out are sold. Things that are not shipped are generally not show, sold. So those things that the goods that are not Because that are not shipped by year end are not sold. This generally, that's a general rule. So unless they've left the place, they are not sold and should be included in ending inventory. So this shipping function, well, it's probably not that high up on the list as far as operations maybe, but it's very important for auditors to know what stuff gets included in it. All right. <clears throat> And these are the couple documents that you're going to actually see. Um, these are these are very important documents, actually. We've talked a little bit about these, I think, already. But now, bill of lading. This is when you load something on a truck. It transfers uh, possessions of the goods to the transportation firm. It does not transfer the title. So the shipping firm does not own the goods. They'll never own the goods. So if bill of lading is taking something that belongs to 
either the buyer or the seller at that point, put it on the truck. The people with on the truck, they don't have title to it. They don't own it. They never will own it. Okay, so it's basically a, a document that says, we've loaded our stuff onto your truck. Uh, what gets shown on there? There we go, the description and weights of it. They'll be signed by both the shipping department and the carrier. Um, so on buyer address, that's probably pretty obvious. But they generally don't have the prices on it. Uh, there's no reason to have the prices on it because there's, they like say, you're not transferring ownership to the um, trucking department. So this bill of lading, this is between the carrier and the seller. Any question on that? And again, the, you know, the, and these bill of lading, you know, these, the, the, and the laws behind bill of lading, all that, they go back hundreds of years. <laughs> you, you can find cases on bills of lading for you know, going back to before, you know, <laughs> before uh, Columbus or whatever. You know, they would have these. And, and actually, you know, it is kind of. Uh, if you go back like shipping and that, you know, the, they'll always have this you know, list of stuff that they're carrying. They, they're they very detailed. You know, they'll, they'll say we had, you know, 5,322 pounds of beeswax or whatever it was. They're, they're very specific as far as what they were carrying. All right. Now, along with the bill of lading is a proof of delivery. Now, Quite honestly, the bill of lading is a more important document. I'll tell you why in a second. Proof of delivery means that whoever ordered it actually got it. And uh, it'll have the date of delivery and signed by the recipient. Okay, so proof of delivery is showing, okay, we, um, you know, that, that they actually received it. Now, here's the thing about bill of lading versus proof of delivery. You might say, well, Proof of delivery is the more accurate one. Why don't we just go right to the proof of delivery? Why don't we just ask for proof of delivery? The problem with proof of delivery is that, first of all, usually you have to contact them. And, you know, the bill of lading, you, are, you already have it. You'll have what they have on, you know, for bill of lading. Um, and second of all, notice that if you have loaded it on the truck and it's gone away, at that point, the client really is somewhat off the hook and that they have no control over what the truck does. Maybe the truck turned over and fell in the river or whatever, um, but they have no control over that. So if they count it as a sale based on the bill of lading, that would simply be what, you know, what they would expect that, okay, we don't longer have it, it's gone. Here's a bill of lading that shows that it has left our place. You know, it's not a fictitious sale. It's they signed off on it. You can look at the goods and the weights and all that kind of stuff and see. And um, the, the client's um, responsibilities are at this point, as far as the goods themselves, is kind of out of their hands. So if you're wondering why the bill of lading tends to be the one that we look at more closely, it's because the bill of lading shows that the client actually did ship something. You know, they, they shipped out what they were supposed to ship out, and you can compare it to, uh, you know, the packing list, the invoice, and all that kind of stuff. Won't have the prices, but you should, it'll have the description of the goods, uh, how many there were, and all that kind of stuff. You can match it up. Any, any questions on that? Okay. Um, so the billing function. Um, so uh, the sales order is uh, where you start at. Now, again, uh, there might be things that are not available out of stock.
Yeah. Okay. So the sales order, because as I may, may differ from the uh, packing listed invoice. Now, the things that should uh, match up. The sales invoice should um, equal the packing slip. Should equal the uh, bill of lading. So, oops. So the invoice, you know, what we're actually charging them should be for only those things that are sent, obviously. And it should match up with the packing slip and the bill of lading. Now, the prices won't be on the bill of lading, but the descriptions should be the same. So someone sent uh, 15 tires. I don't know why it isn't 15. Oh, let's make it uh, 16 tires, maybe, uh, cars or so. So um, uh, I guess it could be for tricycles. But uh, so, so let's say you know, that there should be a list of 15 tires on, and you know, the, it says the brand of the tires and all that kind of stuff. But again, it wouldn't have the, the price on it because it really doesn't matter. It's, you're not transferring the title to them, anyways. Uh, any questions on that? A uh, collection of receivables. And this is one of those things that is. Um, It's, it, it's more difficult than you would think, but uh, collection receivables, they usually have some kind of a credit policy. And it, it's usually done for, um, uh, to, you're always trying to maximize profit. So let, let me give you a um, kind of absurd example. Suppose that I I want to make sure that I collect everything that we sell, so I'm only going to sell to millionaires. Is that a good policy to only sell to millionaires? What's the problem of only selling stuff to millionaires? <laughs> small customer base yeah you're going to turn away a whole bunch of customers that could give you a whole lot more profit so you're just trying to maximize profit that's usually what businesses are in the job to do now as auditors we generally don't get involved in those decisions but you may also look into them because the collection of the receivables um, would indicate whether first of all there could be fictitious sales you know they, they may make an account receivable that doesn't really exist um, but also, it has to do with the uh, valuation. So, you know, one of the reasons why we look at, we do look at the collection of the, of the accounts receivables are oh, right about. Um, so, fictitious sales. Will never be collected because they're fictitious. And also, um, oops. Uh, collectability of accounts receivable is a valuation mm -hmm. issue. You're not going to be able to, to collect them. Um, it has an impact on 
your asset on your um, on your balance sheet. You know, the cash seal on your balance sheet. Those things that you, you are going to be unable to collect, and this, this is based on your policy. You know, on the credit policy, a more lenient policy, you will collect less as a percentage. A stricter policy, you collect more as a percentage. So it, it reflects on those two things. Okay, aging trial balance. You guys have done this like, probably several times. You know, you guys. And aging a trial balance is, is like this. So let's say that it's something uh, so past due. Move on to the next page. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. Say current um, The current ones are the estimated uncollectible is say 2%. 1 to 30 days past due. The further out you get, the less likely it is you're going to collect it. So maybe that goes to 10%. Uh, 31 to 90 days jumps up to 25%. And oops. Ah. Okay, I'm mean, just made those numbers up, obviously. But this is an, an aging of accounts receivable. And the way it works is this if you had, say, a hundred thousand. I am not typing very well today. Uh, the amount of bad debt you expect to have out of that would be 2,000. Oops. Say this was uh, 40,000. Oops. Again, I'm just making up these numbers. So this would be an aging uh, trial balance, and, and you companies do this at the end of, the, of every period. Yeah. The, the software they have nowadays, a lot of times, will actually do it for you. You still have to you, you still have to look at it and make sure that it's doing it right. So you come up with a estimated uncollectible of whatever all that is. Be nine hundred. So this would be a. You know, you say, okay, of all these sales, of 156,000 in sales, or accounts receivable, I should say. Uh, 8,900 of those we'd estimate are not going to be collected. And again, that'd be a valuation thing. So aging trial balance, uh, a lot of you know, a lot of the software nowadays does it automatically, and it'll track. It'll actually keep, it'll actually track these also. The you know it'll come up. You need to do that. It'll actually come up with the estimate on collectible based on what you did in the past. It'll say, okay, in the past, you know, you did collect ten percent of these, whatever it is. But that is a. Um, uh, all companies do it, and you will, as an auditor, you look at this as are these reasonable 
you know, are, are these uh, what you'd expect them to be? Are they reasonable in the circumstances? Sometimes those things that happened in the past um, may or may not be reasonable. You know, if you're in a recession, what you did five years ago probably doesn't really matter because it might be a completely different scene as far as what the, you're going to collect in that. Okay. Uh, one thing though, you do also look on the books for generally, although it's not as big of a deal as you might think, and that is those things that have been in the books for a really long period of time, I, I've seen accounts people that have been in the books for four years. <laughs> Do you think you're going to collect that? Um, it's usually not that big of a deal because usually they'll have a, some allowance made for that, you know, item that you don't think you're going to collect it or whatever. But a lot, a lot of times you get sometimes you get uh, managers and so forth that really don't want to write off an account. Oh no, no, no we're going to, you know, we're going to get it from this, you know, we're going to get that from these people or whatever. But um, as an auditor, one of your things is the, that they, you know, there's nothing wrong with them still trying to collect that, keeping it off the books, you know, but taking it off the books. Um, it, it just shows that something that, that's not going to be there, you know, that it's, not, it's unreasonable. Okay. Industry average for bad debt expense. This is a very weird one. <laughs> And why is this weird? It's weird because this is an analytical procedure. Used as a substantive test. In other words, dollar amounts. And this is, this is one of those ones that is, uh, this is almost the only one that is used this way. It's kind of funny, but analytical procedure, analytical procedures, I think we talked about this before, they generally are not for proving, you know, uh, that the numbers are wrong. You know, for instance, if sales go up, you'd expect selling expenses to go up. Okay, well, that's reasonable, you know, for plausible relationships. They don't usually point out and say, hey, this is wrong, you know. Analytical procedures use a substantive test though. Uh, so industry average for bad debt, you may compare the industry average for bad debt to what your client has. And if it's, if it's materially different and there's no reason for it to be materially different, you may question about what, what they have, uh, uh, you know, why they're using what they're using. So these are analytical procedures. In other words, you know, usually just to point you in the right direction, but they could also be used as a substantive test to say, look, the industry average is at three and a half percent. You guys are using 2.1%. Why? Your, your customers are the same as everybody else's, you know? So these are um, used as a substantive test. So this is kind of a strange one. And it's one of the few things that, uh, where you'll actually find analytical, analytical procedures that can be used for um, substantive tests. Question on that? Okay. Uh, sales journal reconciliation with accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. So this is the sales journal they're talking about. <clears throat> uh, should come off of the sales invoice, not generally the sales order.
Okay, so sales invoices should match. Specific accounts receivables. Um, I'll show you something. I know you guys probably already know this, but. You have your general. Um, and your general ledger, <laughs> all right, you'll probably have a, a, a separate accounts receivable, some kind of a receivable, um, account on the general ledger, but you'll have a subsidiary uh, account of ledger that will have individual accounts. So, so we have accounts receivable from Amy, from Bill, from uh, Kathy, you know, and so these will all be included, you know, in the general ledger. So the, the subsidiary ledgers are the individual ones. In the general ledger, you're not gonna have the 1500 accounts, you know, in the accounts receivable. These will be transferred over. The subsidiary ledger will be totally put into the general ledger, uh, you know, separately. So, sales invoices should match uh, uh, the increase in, in the specific account receivables, subsidiary ledgers. The subsidiary ledger will go into the general ledger. Um, well, yeah, the specific accounts receivables. So, it's a, so that's in the subsidiary ledger. Everybody uses the same terminology, or else. Oops, okay, the subsidiary ledger, this ledger should Sales and accounts receivable cut off. I'm going to be very brief with this one because we're going to do one later. Those lane are used for both. Sales and accounts receivable go hand in hand, and bills of lading are used for both, which we'll talk about later. Uh, let's stop here. Uh, let's see, be back at uh, what time do you guys want to be back at? It's 11 10. Okay, <laughs> never. <laughs> 
we have to go back? Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. All right. Okay. So I'll be at that. So we got like five minutes. Okay, very good.
Okay, it's eight o'clock, so we should probably get going. Um, I think I'm gonna jump ahead though in the handout. Uh, I'm gonna go down here to, we'll do this other stuff later. Uh, let's go to page six. So this is, uh, no wait, this is page seven, I'm sorry. Uh, by the way, is this your, is your page seven, does it show K? Uh, yes. No, okay. All right, this is a kind of an, uh, a problem uh, is with bill of lading and how are you going to determine what is actually sold in the current year versus what is sold in the following year. Now here we have a sales journal And the sales journal looks like the cutoff is right here. So according to the sales journal, these are the sales in these last part of the year. Now, these are the bill of lading over here. Let's make those something different. Okay. So you go, I'm gonna shrink this up. I was not thinking this would be done on the screen. Okay. Now you go and you check the bills of lading and this is what you come up with here. Here's a cutoff. Yeah, it needs to be sequential, right? You know, as, you know as they, as they leave the, the document will be numerically whatever. So 37.85 is the cutoff. Now here's the question. These are the bill of lading. This is the stuff that's actually shipped. This stuff down here was not shipped. It was shipped the next day. Some terrible companies made their drivers work on New Year's Day, but anyway, um, so these are actually the ships. So here's the question, which invoices should be included in the 2020 sales? So here's a sales journal up here. And these are the dates that they have in it. So you presume that this would be the amount that they would show us for the sales for these last items near the cutoff period. And so the question is, which invoices should be shown as a sale in the, uh, for the 2020? The one highlighted in red and yellow. Well, 31. Well, so these are the bills of lading. These are the ones that are actually shipped. So looking at the bills of lading, we should do these, uh, let's do these in green, how about? Oh, 
Okay, so. So which invoices should be included in 2020 sales? I think this, I think this came out of a, um, a CPA exam problem. The ones in green should be included. Yep. So one of these ones in green. So here is what they should have there. I'm gonna, I'll clean up in a second here. Okay, so the total of these are what? Mr. Calculator. How much was recorded in the sales journal? Whatever that is. Forty-eight. You, you may want to check these numbers. <laughs> I have no ill Ill, Ill intent, as we know, but it. Uh, I guess we are. Okay, so they're showing that they have forty-eight hundred in sales when they really should have thirty-one hundred. So, what correction would be necessary? You know, this one is not a sale in the current year. And this one is. So what would be, let's make these closer together. So how much of a correction would they need to make? Oh, you guys are talking about me. Somebody has this. Yeah, I have a question. How, how come the one you highlight, the one on top, you highlighted it in yellow? Is it is it not on the? It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't shipped in the current year. But it wasn't. How how do you figure out that one? But the date says 12-31-2020. The date up here, yeah. The sales journal shows it as being sold here. But if you look down here to the bill of lading. So this is the stuff that actually left. Now remember, if they if they still have it, yeah. Oh, uh -oh. if they still have it, you know, a year end in in on the premises, that it hasn't been shipped. Nobody owes them anything. Got it. Yeah. So the difference will be seventeen hundred. Um. Between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> That's the question I didn't know the answer to. Yes, it would be a difference between these two. So the recorded would be that. And by the way, you know, and this is one of the things that you do when you go when you go to uh, do an audit. You want to find a cutoff for for sales. And by the way, this is also be for accounts receivable. 
because remember, if this stuff wasn't shipped out, they don't owe us $2,100 a year end. So the recorded amount was this. The corrected amount And so the difference is one thousand seven hundred. Yep. Yeah. So this is what you would, uh, you know, have the correction for now. Again, you know, you might look if, if it's material or it's not material is another question. But this would be the difference between what what they should actually have on the books and. Um, what, what, what they what they what they recorded. By the way, looking at this, would you would you initially think that this is fraud or not fraud? Maybe not, just because if it's at that like New Year, um, like maybe they got too many orders and they had to push back. I'm not sure, but maybe at first no. Yeah, yeah, because if you look at this, you know, yeah, they recorded this one that shouldn't have been, but this one should have been recorded in that year, and it wasn't. So it wasn't like there was some kind of a check going on here. It probably wasn't, you know, a check, you know, it probably wasn't a. You would you would have included if you were just trying to make your accounts receivable and your sales look better, you'd included this one. So this is probably more like an oversight thing, you know, the the uh, slip up um, kind of thing that you know. Um, it's not a printer now. Uh, uh, it, it's a printer I should throw out. You know, you know, it's really hard to throw out stuff nowadays, like electronics and stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, I did, I just want to throw it out. You know, you no, know, you have to go drop it off at this point. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, yeah. So it, this would, this looks more like. Probably, even though it looked like the sales would be increased. Well, initially you go, you know, your audit years go up and you go, oh, that must be something terrible. But when you look at it more closely, if they were just trying to inflate it, you know, they would have included this valid one in there, certainly. But um, yeah, probably not. Okay. Well, luckily there's another one that I will be quiet and see if you can figure out L. And while you're doing, while you're doing that, I'm gonna pick my printer up off the Okay, so they under by 400, 
right? Uh, yes, yes, because this one would come out and this one yeah. should go in. Yep, the total trip that I made is 2,400, but the total should be 2,800. Right, yeah, so this would be, um, so they would have, yeah, you're, you're right, yeah, 2,800. So they, it, this is, what, 2,400? Yeah, so, yeah, okay. So, I'm gonna put these down here just for, you know. I should lay this off. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the sales are, they're showing would be 2,400. And it should be. I'll clean this up in a second. Ah, that made it look even worse. Okay. Okay, so these are the ones that should be included would be, like you said, 2,800. This is what they have on the books up here, what they included. I'll, I'll put those in a different color. So they're gonna, they have 2,400. So the difference is, Twenty-four hundred, and the difference is the four hundred. And again, this one most likely is not fraud because they're showing it being $400 less basically. And they should have, they should have had it at 2,800. They only had those at 2,400. So the difference is that. And it's possible it's fraud. It's possible they're trying to decrease the amount of taxes or something like that, but uh, probably fairly unlikely in this case. And another thing I'll tell you too about companies that try to, um, the, the, the legal ramifications of understatements and overstatements. Generally speaking, it's, uh, Generally speaking, it's more you're more likely to be sued if the company's doing worse than you said, rather than they're doing better than what you what you agree, you know, what you um, signed off on for the audit report. What I mean by that is, if a company is more profitable, generally it's harder to get sued for that. Why? Because if 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 a uh, if someone invests in a company because they are doing because it looks like they're doing better than they really are, that's the ground for, for saying, okay, there's a fraud there that, you know, a fraud in with, you know, fraud in the inducement. You, you know, you induce me to invest in this company showing these profits that really weren't there. It's harder to do it the other way around. Now you think that, okay, it, it should be the same, right? You should be able to say, look, I would have invested in that company. You can't generally sue for what you would have done. Right, so even though we say, okay, you gotta look to see if it's overstated and also if it's understated, 
you're more looking at that for something like along the lines of paying taxes and that sort of thing, not generally getting sued by somebody in the public or an investor or a bank or something like that. It'd be hard for a bank to come back and say, these, you know, this company's doing better than it was, you know, that you said. Well, okay, so your loan's more, more secure. Right? There's nothing, you know, it'd be hard to, to have to defend, you know, to, to have to um, prove that you were somehow misled and that you lost money. I think if, if anything, the loan became more secure and the loan's worth more now. So anyway, um, even though we talk about it could be over or understated, if it's good stuff and it's understated, like sales, assets, cash, all that kind of stuff, it's it's generally um, less risky if the company's doing better than if the company's doing worse. Uh, if the company's doing worse, then it, it, people will have a valid claim saying, look, I invested in it. I thought it was, they're making X amount of dollars when they really weren't, and I lost this money. You know, Then it's a little more uh, tricky. Like I say, theoretically, it should be able to go either way, but that's not the way. That's not the way it works in, in real life. Okay, I think I'm going to clean up two more things, and I think we'll call it a night. I am going to put off. Um, I just want to do a couple of these things up here. We'll finish up F and G, and then we'll. Call it night. And uh, the confirmations I'll put off until later. Okay, bill and hold criteria. Bill and hold is when you bill somebody for something, but you still have it in your possession. Now, this must come from whoever the buyer is. This is a very... Um, it, 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 you have to have actually legal document showing that they own it and that you do not own it. Because if it's simply somebody calling up and saying, yeah, can you wait and ship that till, you know, don't, don't ship that until January. That's not a sale. Even if the customer said, no, don't ship it, because they don't owe you anything until it's shipped. So unless they have uh, you know, a legal document showing that they're asking you, they're, they're paying you, and that they're asking you to hold on to it because maybe they don't have room for it, their, their warehouse burned down or whatever, um, you know, there has to be some kind of a legal document that shows that they don't want you to ship it. They'll pay for it, but that you um, still have it. So the general rule for bill and hold is these are not allowed. You know, you can't just put, you know, a sold sticker on it and put it in the corner and say, oh, this is sold. Yeah, there has to be a, a legal documentation, basically, that you have, that they are required to pay you for the inventory and that you're actually holding it as a um, consideration for them, not for yourself. That's not how you spell specific, just in case you're wondering. There we go. But bill and hold are generally not allowed. So if somebody just stamps something as, you know, oh, this is, I'm, we're holding this for a customer. Oh, they're coming in, you know, whatever. It's not sold. It's still in the inventory. Okay, pledging of accounts receivable. And this can come in two different flavors. Um, uh, accounts receivable used as collateral. Or a loan. Oops. Uh, 
So you go to the bank for a loan, they'll say, okay, that's fine, but the, you know, have you pledged the accounts receivable? And basically as you receive the accounts receivable, you pay off the loan so that the collateral goes down the same time the loan goes down. Uh, those are kind of uh, usual arrangements. You also have, uh, one that you have to be careful of is that is that people may have uh, actually sold the accounts receivable. And that is uh, a trickier thing because uh, even though they have it on their, they may have the accounts receivable on their books, they've actually sold the accounts receivable to a bank or some kind of financial institution. So selling the accounts receivable means that they no longer exist. Now, you say, well, why would somebody do that? Why would they sell the accounts receivable and then sell, sell them on the books? Well, they'll show they have more cash, they'll show they have more assets than they really have. The accounts receivable are really not theirs anymore. Somebody else has purchased them. You know, and then they'll discount, they'll take off discounts for how much or whatever they don't collect. But uh, selling the accounts receivable, uh, you have to be careful that it's possible they, and there are places that will buy them. You know, they, again, they, they usually do it at a reduced rate. Banks aren't stupid. So if you have 10,000 accounts receivable and you're gonna collect 9,500, they're gonna give you something below 9,500 um, you know, to make money that they, you know, as you'd expect. Um, but anyway, uh, it's, it is possible you may, they, they may be showing the cash that they receive and still have the accounts receivable on the books. So seeing if they're pledged as collateral is one thing, but also seeing if they are um, actually sold, if the cash are actually sold. Okay, then enough auditing for tonight. I think so. Um, and these uh, confirmations, we'll go into that in the more detail. These are these were actually tested quite a bit on the CPA exam. The um, uh, confirmation, so we'll spend more time on that. We won't we won't be able to get through it tonight anyway. So anyway, uh, we'll leave that for next time. Okay. Uh, any questions? <laughs> yes. Questions? I swear, I'm kick you. Okay. Um, well, uh, we will then. Uh, I'll see you guys in a week's time. I will get your stuff graded as soon as I can. Hopefully tonight, certainly by tomorrow, I should have it all in. But um, any questions? Any of that? So we are not done with this handout. We will continue it. Won't, you, you won't turn that in just yet. And we'll come back next week and do the, the confirmations. Questions? Okay. Well, I'll Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> I'll, say, I'll, say good, I'll say good night and uh, I'll see you guys in a week's time. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Yeah.